Hello and welcome to my review of Desmond Bagley's Domino Island. Bagley is, as I may have mentioned in about 50 of my videos, my favourite thriller writer. The first draft of this book, along with the exchanges between Bagley and his editor concerning a second draft, was discovered by researchers amongst his personal papers. It was adapted by Michael Davies, a self-confessed Bagley fan and a writer himself with somewhat limited qualifications for the job. The plot follows Bill Kemp, a typical Bagley hero with a military background and a no-nonsense attitude who is now working as a troubleshooter for hire. Kemp is asked to investigate the death of David Salton, an entrepreneur with political aspirations on the Caribbean island of Campanilla, otherwise known as Bell Island. Bell Island is a former British colony, and as this novel was set in the 1970s post-Empire, it is now forging its own path one sadly full of corruption and the possibility of potentially violent revolution. Salton was the beacon of hope for the island going forward, and his death threatens its peace and prosperity. However, Kemp's job is initially just one to investigate Salton's death for the insurance company. Even that small job, however, has consequences for the island, and Kemp gets dragged into a mystery of escalating stakes and danger. In Techniques of Novel Writing, Bagley detailed his own methodology for writing a book, starting with a location that should be as real as any of the characters, and that is certainly true of Campanilla, with Bagley showing us the booming coastal tourist areas and the tensions with the interior, the divide between the two being forged by disparities of wealth and class. One observer Riley notes of Campanilla, there's a building boom, they're putting up hotels so fast that if your bedroom isn't built when you check in, you still sleep soundly that night. But Kemp, driving into the island's interior, remarks on the differences. The ambience changed and the air cooled a little as I went inland. There were fewer white faces and more black, fewer bikinis and more cotton shifts, less concrete and glass and more corrugated iron. This isn't just a localised transition though because Bagley shows the remnants of the imperial system mixing with the newly felt American economic power and the changing world outside. Salton's private airstrip, for example, was once a base for British and American air forces in World War II. Now it's a millionaire's plaything. Something of a white elephant given its limited usage, again a reminder of similar projects in other ex-colonies, though there they were usually instigated by the local governments. Something Bagley himself would revisit in Juggernaut, of course. Kemp also considers his changing role in the world, having left the military, remarking on its own transition from preparing for World War III to more modern efforts of counterinsurgency in Malaya, Cyprus and Northern Ireland. All of this sets Kemp himself up as a modernist, though perhaps it is uh, Davies at work here because the Cold War was very much alive when this was written in 1972, and Kemp otherwise remains a suit-wearing, scotch-drinking investigator from the old school disliking the American cars and not approving of swearing in front of a woman, and with an unshakable belief in the impartiality and effectiveness of newspaper journalists. His investigation, however, is something rather pleasant among more modern literary efforts, in that he actually seems to have a method, and little by little he coaxes out a mystery that holds the interest well enough even if Bagley has written better before and after this effort. The way Bagley tightens the screws with each step of Kemp's investigation increasing the stakes and danger is rather masterful. After an early visit to Jill Salton, he finds her coldly intriguing, her story just plausible enough to trouble Kemp and have him using, under no circumstances in law, can a murderer benefit by inheritance from the person murdered. This is, in the early stages then, something of a whodunit, something Bagley in his correspondence considers his style ill-suited to, yet his essay again says that the initial plan is to write a series of characters in situations and see where it takes them, and that is certainly working to his advantage here as Kemp unravels person after person who may or may not have a hand in Salton's disappearance. Then on page 75, Bagley delivers the double whammy of Jill unexpectedly taking off in David Salton's jet, established as his baby and of no real interest to her. This sudden move is intriguing and unexpected. Then Ogilvy, Kemp's right-hand man, is assaulted by persons unknown and hospitalised. Things then escalate rapidly, Kemp is threatened himself, and with Kemp's investigation being used by revolutionaries to stir rumours that Salton may have been murdered, there's then rioting in the streets. Add to this the uncertain position of Hannah, the chief detective, and his corrupt boss, and things build nicely and rapidly with the stakes spreading from a small whodunit towards a revolution that will encompass the whole island. The peak arrives when Kemp is attending a prime minister's function. The contrast between the colonial Rococo inside and the raw street outside, between the urbane civilities of the cocktail hour and those clenched fists, made me realise what the Tsar and his family must have felt before the mob stormed the Winter Palace. The rioting and violence that follows is a sustained period of tension and action that marks something of a high point for the novel, though. As mentioned, despite the efforts of Mr Davies, this was only Bagley's first draft, and that does mean it comes with one or two problems. 
Firstly, the proliferation of characters with surnames that may or may not be an atronym seems out of place with Bagley's work. I don't recall him doing this before, and it's striking enough when we get Mr. Jolly and Mr. Idle in short succession that one of the characters remarks on the latter, My God, I said, that name doesn't sound too promising. It's from the Welsh Ithel, meaning Lord Bountiful. The, these two may actually be an inaptonym, but we still get Mr. Stern, the lawyer, and Konya, the politician. Now, that last one may be looking at this through a 21st century eye, and it may even be pronounced Konya, but that's what three examples of something do. They get you looking for a fourth. I wonder if any of them would have survived a second Bagley draft. Additionally, there are a couple of minor scenes that don't work very well. Kemp's badgering of Jill Salton over her husband's wardrobe on his chair seems irrelevant given that he was supposed to have left suddenly and angrily. It seems a little like an author trying to second-guess his audience and ending up answering questions that nobody's asking. We can contrast that with Kemp's lack of concern regarding Jill Salton when violence erupts on the island. She may not face specific danger from the revolutionaries using her husband's name as a rallying call, but the violence is used by the government's conspirators to attack Kemp and Jill, and the Salton name could be something of a lightning rod for trouble, making her an even bigger target. Likewise, Inspector Hannah's position is even more troubling. His continued investigation, having arrested four members of the police and his own superior in a conspiracy that seems to go all the way up to the Prime Minister, would certainly make him a target as well. The payoff to the scene where the government aides try to bribe Kemp isn't quite right either, with the dialogue throughout needing another draft and it ends with this. Christ, he said, you're a really dangerous man. You'd better watch it. That isn't how danger works, my friend. The death of Ogilvy establishes Kemp as something of an avenger when he asks one suspect, What do you know about it? Nothing, he said. Nothing at all. You'd better be right, I said coldly, for your own sake. This is again something that another draft or two perhaps could have helped. It isn't bad because Kemp's relationship with Ogilvy is fairly solid based on a practical joke over Jill Sorton and another joke about James Bond over Ogilvy's double O initials. But Kemp tells Negrini, and therefore us as readers, that Ogilvy is a family man only after the attack. The attack is pretty brutal. I found Ogilvy looking like something recently excavated from a sarcophagus. The bits of him that weren't bandaged were blue with bruising. He breathed stertorously, but then he was lucky to be breathing at all. He was still unconscious. But in 81 pages to this point, Ogilvy is only ever really an afterthought to Kemp. A bit more involvement and cooperation between the two could have really helped this scene have more impact. By far the biggest problem with Domino Island is the final act, which issues nearly all of the political scheming to this point, and reveals the whole thing to be nothing more than a heist, a heist which seems pretty unlikely, as it involves the death of a hundred innocent people and the crashing of two jets. The perpetrators in classic movie bad guy mode also detail their plan to Kemp, and just none of it seems very likely or well planned, despite their insistence to the contrary. So not only is it not completely convincing, it doesn't quite tie together all of the threads of story that Bagley has intricately laid to this point. In conclusion, there's much to enjoy in Domino Island, especially as it's a book Bagley fans like myself couldn't have dreamed they'd ever get to read so long after his death. In that regard, it's a must read. In terms of the Bagley bibliography, for much of its length, it's a fine entry. However, in techniques on novel writing, Bagley mentions a book he wrote and then abandoned, which was the only time he had ever written to a pre-established synopsis. I wonder if Domino Island is that book, because Domino Island starts out as a whodunit, which in the paratext here Bagley acknowledges requires more careful preparation than his usual method. His criticism of writing to a synopsis, then, is that if you start a story and it leads somewhere unforeseen, trying to force it back to its original ending will break the magic spell of the willing suspension of disbelief. Disillusion sets in because the reader believes himself to have been cheated. I really don't feel cheated by the ending of this, but I do feel that Bagley got from A to W very slickly, and regarding this as a first draft, I have no doubt that a few more tweaks here and there, well, this would have been peak Bagley. But as it stands, X, Y, and Z, while certainly not awful, belong elsewhere. As good as it is, if you're completely new to Bagley, I'd recommend starting with Running Blind or Spoilers. If you're not, then this is wholeheartedly recommended, with just a small part of that based on nostalgia for the Bagley canon, and the rest for its own undoubted strengths. So next week I'll be back with the usual efforts of science fiction and fantasy, and coming up I've finally started my most requested review, so the two people that asked for that five years ago will be well pleased, provided they've liked this video, subscribed, and remembered that without ringing the bell, you don't get notified when I upload videos.